Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the City Club of Chicago. I'm Anne Marie St. Germain, a member of the Board of Governors, and I chair the Program Committee for City Club. Joining us today are Sam Skinner and Samir Mayakar. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors, 8 Hospitality, 8 Ecom, CRRC, John Welber Concessions Development, Kivit, Stiefel, and thank you especially to board member Omar Davistani for that sponsorship. Sam K. Skinner is a counsel to the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. He's had a long and storied career in the government, higher education, and private sectors. Sam is the retired chairman, president, and chief executive officer of USF Corporation, one of the nation's leading transportation logistics companies. During each year that he served as CEO, the company was recognized by Fortune Magazine as one of America's most admired companies. From 1993 to 1996, he was president of Commonwealth Medicine Company and its holding company, Unicom, one of the country's largest utilities. Prior to this, Sam served as Secretary of Transportation and as Chief of Staff, President George W. Bush. Welcome, Sam. Glad to have you. Samir Mayakar is Deputy Mayor for Economic and Neighborhood Development. Samir served in the Obama administration for two years in the White House and at a federal infrastructure agency. He co-founded and serves as CEO of Nanograph Corporation, a global manufacturer of chemicals, and both a green energy company that continues to grow in Bronzeville. Samir has deep neighborhood roots in the city having served as board chair for the Community Engaged Youth Theater in Albany Park and a Grammy Award winning musical serving the back of the arts neighborhood. He holds a bachelor's from Northwestern, an MBA from Kellogg, and he received the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. He's fluent in Spanish and married to Dr. Emily Mayakar, an orthopedic surgeon serving Chicago's South Side. Welcome, Samir. Hello. Um, let's uh, let's start with Sam. If you could share your opening thoughts with us, and then we will uh, hear from Samir and and do some Q and A. Sam. Good, Andrew. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate this opportunity. I know Samir and Samir and all of you here as well. Uh, the uh, the recovery task force was formed with the idea that at a critical time in the city's history, we needed to understand the problem. Hey, the the really and uh, I'm some static back here. I don't know if you're hearing it as well. But uh, everybody who's not talking to me, put themselves on mute. we we'll figure that out. But uh, uh, so we set this task force up with the idea that we could uh, get together the best people in the city and the city and ask their advice on what to do now that we have this situation with the virus and what we could do to bring Chicago back to the viable place that it was in the going forward. We gathered together a lot of great, talented people. The mayor is just one of the people that and the mayor staff that worked on it. In addition, we had a committee made up of over 200 people from all walks of life and all parts of business, both private and public sector, to help us identify the problem and then move forward. Uh, some of these people, uh, if you haven't got the deck, we'll send it to you. The people including, of course, uh, the mayor, the co-chair with me, people from the University of Chicago, Tony Preckwinkle, the chairman of the county board, uh, the mayor Tamburino from Hillside, who heads represents the mayors of the region, uh, a number of people from the neighborhood, Emily Hobson from the business community along with Jimmy Stanley, Richard Edelman, and a number of others. We've issued a report, and I encourage you to read it. It's 100 and some pages long, but it's available online. It gives a lot of the summary of what we're doing. I would then just comment on what we tried to do is recognize the issues and come up with a very detailed plan to help us move to the next step, which is basically implementation of the recovery task force problems. I would say that looking at the report and talking about the issues that we found, we came up with the following five priorities. 
number one, to make sure that the value of transparency is where we are and where we need to go and how to get there as present. Everybody was involved. There were no secrets in this report nor the study. Number two, the report and its recommendations demand inclusion and diversity, and diversity and inclusion are part of our recommendations. Number three is equity. Uh, make sure that whatever we do is done with equity in mind, especially as it relates to the South and West sides of Chicago and those papers that have received the impact, the greater impact of the coronavirus and, the, and, and are living with it. Four is to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, we're going to be held accountable by a, a small subset of the committee that developed this report to report to the mayor regularly on what we're doing to implement it and also what we're doing in transformation. The mayor's priorities were set up by the recovery task force are investing in the south and west side, reducing violence, sustainability of city finances, looking at the impact that it has had on the city finances and what we can do to correct it, good governance, and most importantly, investing in the youth of our city as we go forward in the region so that they can participate when we come back to work, come back to school, and we can make up for those things that they've lost during the, uh, during the virus uh, and the aftermath of that. Uh, Samir has been leading this effort on behalf of the mayor. Uh, with those things in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Samir and ask him to give us a little bit of update on what we're doing, why we're doing it, and then we'll open up the questions and answers. With that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Samir. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Now, before I dive into the specifics of the recovery task force findings, I really wanted to take a moment and rewind back to when Mayor Lightfoot first came back into office and provide some pre-COVID economic data that highly influenced the mayor's agenda, and which is really relevant today because it shaped not only our response to the crisis, but it shaped how COVID impacted the city. And so when the mayor came into office, she very frequently referenced the map. And for those of you who've seen her talk uh, at the Economic Club or other forums, you've probably seen some version of this map that highlights that 50 years of public policy still has not changed this map. And if anything has exacerbated the issues of income disparity in Chicago. So what you see here is in our South and West Side communities, especially you've seen a greater concentration of low income populations and you've seen wealth concentration migrate to the north side of the city and the central business district. And so the, the question is, how do we get more equitable flows of investment throughout the city, especially so that we can grow that middle class? This map shows that that salmon color area, which is the middle class, it's been largely crowded out. Now, this is a trend that we've all been seeing nationally, certainly. Um, and as you see what some economies call a K-shaped recovery coming out of COVID, um, we were already on that trajectory here in Chicago. And so as you really want to get a lens into how the mayor thinks about what our responsibilities are as a, as a government, this map is always on the mind of the mayor. And she says, you know, very frequently, we need to change this map. So another piece of information that I think is important to highlight is, uh, you know, how that map manifests itself across different metrics. Certainly we've seen huge life expectancy disparities of 20 to 30 years between our neighborhoods. This shows between many of our peer cities, unemployment rates as sliced uh, against our uh, black population and Latinx population. And what you'll see is that the unemployment rate in the black community um, is almost twice as higher than any other group and is an outlier among some of our peer cities. So that map of disinvestment has really translated into some of these other metrics. And this was all pre-COVID. And, and what I'll get to later on in this presentation is to talk about the impacts post-COVID, um, which pose additional challenges. So again, variations on a theme of the map. What this uh, set of data highlights, and this was part of a chain study that we embarked on with the Civic Consulting Alliance and McKinsey. This shows, again, uh, before the crisis hit, you can see outcomes based on uh, where you grew up. And so this shows, based on where you grew up as a child, your potential for adulthood income or adulthood employment. 
Now they, they lay out that same story, but really this is the story of the fact that your zip code in Chicago in many cases can determine your fate. And so collectively as a government, as a nonprofit community, as a private sector community, we have to do a better job of creating more opportunities so all of our residents can fulfill their true potential. And that's never been more important than now as we tackle this virus. So the, the, the other page I wanted to show is, is this one really struck me is about investment trends. So when the mayor first came into office, the Urban Institute put out a report that it looked at five years of investment flows in Chicago. And what that story told, they, they disaggregated it first based on private investment flows and then in public investment flows uh, in the nonprofit sector. And what you see on the top right-hand page here is on average, uh, the low in, uh, higher income neighborhoods. So by because of the nature of segregation in Chicago, this tends to be kind of in the central business district and the north side of the city, um, having about $40,000 per household of investment. And that's compared our lower income communities, uh, which are at a less than $5,000 of private capital flows. So you see a four to five X difference in private capital flows uh, into our neighborhoods. And then you compare that on the bottom right hand side with where the public sector is investing, both the government and then also the philanthropic sector, you'll see that they're disproportionately investing into the lower income part of Chicago. What this tells us is that there's been a failure of that public investment and that nonprofit investment to truly catalyze transformative investment in our neighborhoods. And that has been a guiding principle for so many of our programs like Invest Southwest that we'll talk about a little bit later. But all of this economic data has really informed uh, the mayor's agenda as Sam alluded to. So when Mayor Lightfoot came into office, she's a values-based leader and she really brought in these five values, transparency, diversity, inclusion, equity, accountability, and transformation in to, to shape the government, to really shape public policy. And that manifested itself into five key areas of investment that Sam laid out. Now, these remain the values and priorities of the administration, but now you have COVID layered on top of this and has made many of these priorities all the more urgent. We certainly will have a conversation about violence reduction and about neighborhood investment. But when you consider the fact that we're tackling a 100-year pandemic stacked on top of a 75-year level of an economic downturn, stacked on top of a 50-year level of civil unrest, we have to collectively as a city rise to this challenge, both in terms of near-term policy and medium and long-term policy. So what I'm going to lay out now is some of the near-term steps that we've been taking to tackle the COVID crisis as we begin to recover. And then I'm gonna get into more of the specifics of the recovery task force report, which is really that longer term vision. Now this was particularly important to the mayor. You know, in any crisis, you have to not only look down in front of you and take steps on the sidewalk. And I'll add that sidewalk has been ever changing. Those stones keep moving, but you have to keep taking steps to make sure you don't trip. So we lead the city through the crisis but you always have to keep in mind, and the mayors really pushed us to make sure that we're thinking about the horizon, the destination, the medium and long-term impacts of COVID and how we're planning for them now. So we're not just thinking about the near-term impacts of COVID. And that's why we're so proud to be the first American city to publish a comprehensive recovery plan. Um, and I have to say a big thank you to Sam for his tremendous leadership in really shepherding over a hundred stakeholders in getting to that report. So if we go back to the near term and how we've handled the immediate COVID crisis, you know, what, what I think is important to recognize as a state and as a city, we really truly have handled this crisis in a way that is differentiating, certainly versus some of our peers. So the course of COVID has changed three times in the last five months. But when you look at this chart in terms of the caseload that different states have seen, you know, we'll all remember what happened in New York. And for those of you who read the Wall Street Journal this weekend, you probably saw some of the deep dives into that, you know, uh, relationship challenges that the governor and the mayor had there in New York. Now, you, you see the lack of early intervention in New York and what that led to. I will note that New York closed off their city at the same time as Chicago did, and we had a much lower level of COVID in Chicago. And the key chart is you'll see that we've remained fairly consistent 
we've really managed the flow of this virus uh, as well as we can. Uh, and that's been one of the reasons why our economy is performing the way it is. And I'll show you some of the, those statistics. But later on in this crisis, you can see what happened in California, in Florida, in Texas. Uh, and again, thanks to the leadership of the business community, our nonprofit community, and the public sector under the governor and the mayor, you've seen us really maintain the case levels at, at a low rate. Um, and, and that is due to uh, leadership and all of us coming together as a community. So in terms of our immediate short-term public health response, we've taken a number of steps. I think you're all pretty familiar with these, but I will note that the stay-at-home order came into effect in March 26th. We also recognized this was a marketing challenge. So we launched the, the successful Stay Home, Save Lives campaign. It was that swift early reaction that has gotten us to where we are today. And I think in particular, we have a level of unity in leadership uh, between the governor, between the mayor, between the business community and our nonprofit community that's helped us tackle this in a way um, that has been truly different than many of our peers. And as we reopen the economy from June to July to today, uh, you know, we've we very gradually turned up that dimmer switch um, rather than you know, overdoing it. I will note that when Los Angeles opened up their economy, I think they opened up their restaurants to about 50 or 60% capacity off the bat. Um, that led to a half million people congregating in bars and restaurants uh, over the course of one weekend. That led uh, you know, to another surge in cases, which led to another lockdown. Um, so to this day, Chicago remains the largest open city in America. And you'll see that in some of the economic data. So thanks to our friends in Bank of America, they've sliced and diced some of the consumer spending statistics uh, based on how they track credit and debit card spending. And if you look uh, every week, Chicago is near the top of the pack in terms of year on year spending growth by consumers. So we remain the largest open city in America. Um, and we also have a tremendous amount of consumer spending strength uh, despite the COVID crisis. And that's because of the way we've tackled COVID, uh, because of swift interventions. That's because our residents and businesses have been amazingly adherent to public health orders, uh, but also it's due to the underlying strength of the Chicago economy. You know, I don't have to remind this crowd that Chicago has the most diverse economy of any American city. No one sector occupies more than 14% of our economy. And that's why you'll see us at the top of the pack here in this consumer spending data. Now, cities like Detroit have very consistently been ahead and that's because they're incredibly concentrated in manufacturing that has weathered the storm and has had to weather the storm uh, because of what we need domestic manufacturers to produce. But when you compare us to San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Los Angeles, you'll see that they really do not see the levels of spending growth that, that we've seen in Chicago. And I believe New York just announced that they'll start opening restaurants indoors at the end of this month. And we've been there since June. Um, so despite the fact that you know, we still have a lot of this crisis to tackle, um, we are amidst the, the leading cities. And that's what you'll see in the small business data as well. We partnered with the University of Chicago Poverty Lab, and they use data from a database called Homebase and what you'll see here is that our small business recovery outpaces other cities. Now, obviously, as look, as a former small business owner myself, these numbers are still incredibly challenging. You'll see here both the number of hours scheduled uh, and how those have changed since uh, pre-COVID and the number of employees that firms in the small business community employ uh, as a percentage of pre-COVID crisis. Now, they're still over 25%. That is deeply concerning. It's something that we are really focusing our attention on. But when you compare them with Houston, with Los Angeles, with New York, uh, we, we have rebounded in a, in a better way, but we still have uh, a, a longer way to go. Now, I want to show you more of this data in terms of us being in the midst of recovery. So uh, you can see, that, again, the home-based data where we've teamed up with the Poverty Lab. You can see after that immediate downtick, uh, in small business activity, there's been a gradual increase. Now, there was a chance that this was going to be a V-shaped recovery. It's looking more like that Nike fluke. It really depends on what sector you're looking at. Um, but what I will say 
is we have a long way to go and you're seeing some plateauing of this recovery, uh, especially at the end of the fall. This, this story really tells you that we need more federal support. So as programs like PPP and CARE have, uh, have dried up, um, this is an area where a municipality simply does not have enough levers to pull to help those businesses recover. And so federal support is going to be critical to changing this plateau in addition to how we tackle the virus and continually gradually dialing up that dimmer switch of the economy. Um, what I would like to show though, is despite that federal support today, um, the city of Chicago has tremendously stepped up to promote recovery in the near term. Um, so what you see here is five different funds that we have launched uh, both as a municipality and in partnership with our nonprofit and business community partners uh, to the total of an allocation that nears almost $150 million. Um, and what's important to know about that, that $150 million, is it is truly a leading amount of money versus other cities. And I'll get there in a moment. But you see here, in terms of Small Business Resiliency Fund, we've pr we created a $100 million loan fund with low interest loans to help those companies that did not get PPP support, that, that didn't filter through the cracks, micro businesses, under five people. That was the focus of, of the Micro Business Recovery Grant Fund. The Together Now Fund, $10 million to help those businesses that were impacted by civil unrest. And then the City Arts Fund that was to help um, one of our most vibrant and vital communities in the city of Chicago, which is our, our arts community. So all of these were designed in a way to complement federal programs. And when you compare those with our peer cities, you know, I'm proud to tell you that under the mayor's leadership, the city of Chicago has truly differentiated itself in terms of how we are allocating and dispersing our funding. So we are now uh, have about over 300% more funding as a municipality allocated to this near-term rebuilding and recovery for our small business community versus a city like New York. And we have more than New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco combined in terms of how the city is stepping up. So as Chicagoans, we should all be proud because we've all made this happen. Now we know this is not enough, but it shows you that the city of Chicago has truly stepped up uh, and been truly agile and nimble. And as an ex startup guy, you know, I will tell you, we are constantly pushing the government to do permitting faster, to having programs like the expanded outdoor dining program, not get stuck in bureaucratic red tape of permitting. We've been able to be nimble. Uh, throughout this crisis. And that I think has been a critical reason why you see some of those statistics uh, in terms of consumer spending increase. It's been to our collective effort. Now, one of the things uh, Sam had mentioned that the mayor always is focused on is equity. So we have mapped out how the $4 billion of PPP money in Chicago uh, matrixed throughout the city. And you will see that it was highly concentrated in certain neighborhoods. And that's why we designed some of our funding programs. Now this one focuses on the $100 million Small Business Resiliency Fund. You can see why we've actually taken an equity lens to those, taken that $100 million and made sure that we have equity allocations throughout the city to make sure that those businesses that fell through the cracks of that PPP support, that they are being supported. And you'll see that here in the first wave of loans that were distributed you'll see that they're heavily concentrated on the west side, on the southwest side, on the south side, uh, because those businesses really fell through the cracks of PPP. Just to give you one statistic, in our small business community, in terms of Black-owned small businesses, only 30% of Black-owned small businesses have a stable lending relationship with the bank. Now, that happens to be a critical variable to getting PPP money. And that is why municipal-led programs like this Small Business Resiliency Fund are so vital because that access to capital is not equitably distributed. And we've really been working with our CDFI community and our lending community to improve that. Um, but until we do, this, this program is, is really targeted on those equity allocations. And we have, you know, we have more to do to get that funding out the door. But part of the reason why it's been so prudently coming out the door to make sure that it has equity in mind. Now, what I just laid out was near term, some of those steps of keeping us moving forward on the sidewalk and not getting tripped up. But in April, 
the mayor launched the recovery task force with Sam as a co-chair, and she launched it at Water Tower Place because the symbolism here is really important because the Water Tower Place, you know, was resilient to the great fire and truly how we recover from COVID needs to be, as the mayor said, a moment that is definitive in Chicago's history, just as our recovery from the fire was. Now, Sam told you about the significant diversity of those recovery task force members. And that was particularly important because in the middle of this recovery task force work, it was an eight to 10 week sprint. You know, we had the murder of George Floyd. We had a civil society uprising that was unique in American history. And as one of the pastors on the task force helped say, we have to focus on the dual threat of COVID-19 and the threat of systemic racism which is what he called COVID-1619. So there's a significant lens on racial equity in this report. That report, uh, as I said, was the first recovery report put out by an American city. And what it laid out in its 100 pages is a focus on six targeted outcomes. That is number one, addressing new and old traumas. And I'll get to this in a moment, but we are seeing uh, tremendous impacts on our population's mental health. It's something you see earlier in Korea and China when you looked at the earlier trajectory of this virus. Secondly, expanding economic opportunity and financial security for our residents. Earlier, I, I spoke about that map. Well, we have to focus on how we're going to change that map. Third is focusing on our, regions, on our regional strengths. This was a regional focus report, not just Chicago centric. And we're going to highlight a few sectors that we're going to be doubling down on. Four, how do we capture opportunities created by COVID? There are sectors that are doing well despite this crisis. And how do we focus on those better? Fifth, how do we reignite economic activity through Chicago by better sharing our story, um, which is a, really a marketing and business development challenge? And then finally, how do we accelerate investments to eliminate inequities? This is about continuing the mayor's agenda that was already in place pre-COVID. Programs like the Invest Southwest program that my team leads, programs like the Solutions to Ending Poverty. These programs are all the more important now as we enter a complicated budget cycle and as we really try and equitably recover from COVID. So as the first step to implementing those six steps of uh, the six priorities in the Recovery Task Force report, we commissioned an economic change study that highlighted some of that data I already showed, but it also showed who's most vulnerable to the changes brought to the economy from COVID. And what you'll see here is what should be no surprise is that it is our lower income Chicagoans who are also the most vulnerable to those economic impacts from COVID. So over 70% of jobs at risk are from workers earning under $40,000 a year. And so this change study highlighted this immense challenge that we could see a K-shaped recovery. Um, and we have to make sure that public policy really is in place to, to, to tackling that challenge um, because, because some of those trends that we saw pre-COVID are only going to get more exacerbated post-COVID. Now, what that economic change study also highlighted is there are glimmers of hope. There are tremendous underlying strengths in the Chicago economy. You know, on the left-hand side of this page, what you'll see is that we have that most diverse economy in the country. We have an incredibly diverse population, which can be a strength. We have a tremendous size of the economy here in Chicago. We've got the second most number of Fortune 500 headquarters in Chicago. These are strengths. We also have tremendous assets in terms of our higher education, and our infrastructure, transit systems. You know, O'Hare last year was the busiest airport in America. In terms of transit, we have the second uh, largest and, and most expansive transit system in the country to New York. And the mayor actually kept CTA service at constant levels despite COVID to focus on those economic uh, vulnerable workers and, and those essential workers. Um, and that's not something that New York did. That's not something Los Angeles did. So we really have tremendous strengths to build off of. So despite the fact that we have headwinds, we do have to build off of these strengths. So what I'd like to do is really get into the meat of those recovery task force recommendations. And then uh, it's important that we 
kind of answer some of your questions. So on first, uh, addressing new and old traumas, one of the initiatives that you'll see coming out of this in the near term is a 211 system. This is like a 911 or 311 system, but focused on gaining access to mental health. That is a key priority for the remainder of this year. And as we go into next year, the goal is really to launch that system and also to expand our mental health workforce. So you're going to see tremendous investments from our Department of Public Health in expanding that mental health infrastructure. Secondly, when it comes to expanding economic opportunity and financial security, um, you know, we really do have to focus on increasing opportunity for that vibrant, small, medium-sized enterprise community, especially with a focus on black and brown owned businesses. We need to increase the percentage of our minority workforce in the construction economy. And we need to pilot innovative systems like portable benefit schemes to help some of those most vulnerable workers. Now, this also has to do with the city easing permitting, easing licensing, cutting red tape. You're going to see a tremendous focus on that from our team here to make sure that the government isn't a friction to economic development and recovery. The third focus is building on our region's strengths. This focuses on parts of the economy that are going to keep growing where we have strengths. Most importantly, our TDNL and warehousing sector, where we do want to leverage this momentum. We heard from so many CEOs that supply chains are going to localize. That was already a trend from seeing tariffs at the federal level, but we heard from so many CEOs that they want to bring jobs back. They want to bring sourcing back and we can cater a manufacturing led recovery, um, which ties the TDNL. I'll point out that we have the largest intermodal system uh, in the Western hemisphere. Additionally, healthcare and life sciences, we're seeing double digit growth in that sector. And I'm going to tell you some very positive stories we have there. And then finally, food and agriculture. We are a leader in food manufacturing in the country. And COVID has taught us that more localized supply chains are important. So we're going to build off these strengths, build a very heightened business development, outbound recruitment effort to promote net regional growth and grow in these sectors. We also want to target opportunities created by COVID. So like I mentioned, that uh, opportunity in manufacturing, we're one of the largest cities that has as much manufacturing in it as we do. You're not going to see that in LA or in New York. Uh, we are also going to capture uh, regional growth of HQ2s. We heard from a lot of CEOs that as they rethink their workforce infrastructure, they're thinking of diversifying it. And as this trend to remote works and hybridization of the workforce continues, the cost of living, the vibrancy of our neighborhoods, and the great transit can be an asset in Chicago as companies rethink some of their footprint. And we've had a lot of inbound in terms of uh, you know, companies expressing interest in the benefits of Chicago. And then finally, film and TV. All those Hollywood writers were very busy writing during the lockdown in, in the West Coast and the East Coast, and they're ready to film. So we actually have a SWAT team that's been assembled that has a very sophisticated promotional pitch with us in the state. And we have already hit over 200 film studios and we're seeing the dividends of that now with more filming and an increase in activity. So our friends at Cinespace are certainly more active and we have made more spaces in the city more amenable uh, from a permitting standpoint to filming. And we're very happy to see that. In fact, Fargo, I believe just wrapped up last week. Finally, how do we support sharing our story, reinvigorating marketing and business development? This is where we do hope to introduce a master brand for the city in 2021. We want to reimagine that regional tourism ecosystem. We want to reimagine what conventions will look like as uh, COVID has changed that landscape. Uh, we want to deal in our neighborhoods to tourism, and we want to show the world that Chicago is open for business. So what you'll see here as a theme, Mayor Lightfoot has really expected from us, and it's been her leadership and Sam's as co-chair, they're holding our feet to the fire to make sure that this recovery effort is not about temporary scaffolding, but it's really about a permanent foundation. And so thanks to our efforts and to our colleagues at the uh, Civic Consulting Alliance, uh, we've actually had a team on the ground for the past eight weeks that, that's built a whole PMO structure here that we are project managing against all these milestones to making sure that this is something that's not a report that's going to sit on a shelf, um, but it's actually going to be implemented. 
And what I can tell you is you're already going to see some of those results. Um, some of you might have seen this uh, nice full page ad that was taken out, I believe, in the Sun Times and the Wall Street Journal, Cranes and the Tribune. I want to say thank you to all the chambers uh, and workers in Chicago and others who, who really sponsored those ads. But they welcomed new growth in our city over the past month. Um, what, what does that look like? Well, you probably read the news today about Amazon expanding its workforce. They're expanding a number of facilities, some that they announced already, and I'm sure more that uh, will be coming in the pipeline. Uh, the Department of Energy, thanks to the mayor's pushing, she was with the Secretary of Energy a few weeks ago. They recently announced $230 million of quantum investment for quantum research investment in, in Chicago and our region at Fermi Labs and Argonne Labs, and there will be a quantum hub built on the south side of Chicago. That represents 30% of the federal investment in quantum technologies. So this, you know, the tech entrepreneur in me knows this is gonna lead to more venture capital investment and more startups. Um, the story of Xerox Pharmaceuticals, this is a company in San Diego that actually chose to relocate their R&D facilities. And what they do is uh, life science research from San Diego, which is one of the most rich life science hubs, but also pretty expensive. And they're locating themselves in Fulton Market in a brand new building uh, that's being built. So you're seeing net growth in people betting on Chicago. In addition to companies like New Cold, uh, where you're also gonna see a tremendous expansion of cold storage. Uh, and this plays into both that food and ag narrative and that narrative around TD&L and warehousing. So I think what you should all take away from this is, Companies are betting on Chicago because of our strengths, and we expect this momentum uh, to absolutely continue. So what I want to do with is how you can help. So for all of you business leaders out there, I've certainly fielded a number of calls. The mayor has, Sam has, Melody has, and they're asking, you know, how can we step up in this moment? Well, there's four ways that you can step up. Number one, uh, you can update your procurement practices to support Chicago businesses, black and brown owned businesses. You can really use your PL to stimulate the local economy. So I would challenge you to do that. We're gonna be putting out more lists in the near term so you can support those businesses. Secondly, diversifying your workforce and hiring locally from our neighborhoods. Third, hire, harnessing the power of your balance sheet to invest in our community. Starbucks did this with a $10 million investment into CDFIs off their uh, balance sheet. And you can do that as well. It doesn't cost your business anything to reallocate funding from certain types of maybe alternative asset allocation into CDFIs. Um, this is how we change neighborhood investment. And then finally, thinking about extending your physical put footprint into our neighborhoods. Uh, you probably saw that we have three active RFPs for Invest Southwest in Auburn Gresham, in Englewood, and in Austin. We want to make sure that we're stimulating economic development in our neighborhoods so that economic recovery happens equally. So if you're interested in any of these activities, please get in touch with your Chamber of Commerce or with my team directly, uh, because we wanna make sure that we are really supporting equitable growth. Uh, and there's gonna be a lot for us to do over the months and over the years that come. Uh, but the mayor, Sam, myself, we are incredibly optimistic about Chicago's future. And what I wanna end on is this, if we do our work successfully together with recovery, we will see what the mayor originally set out to do with her economic development plan. And that is to see net regional growth and really to turn around that trajectory of our 2.7 million residents to get up to 3 million. And secondly, it's to really grow household income and to see that income gap close and that map change. So we can do this together. There is absolutely a plan for it. And we look forward to working with all of you to implement it. And with that, I will turn it over to our colleagues in the city club so we can have some Q and A. Thank you, Samir, and thank you, Sam. Let's get right into it. We have a number of questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Let me just kick things off by asking a, a, a big picture question. Um, given all that's been happening in the city, uh, how do you strike the balance when focusing on the recovery of the central business district and that of neighborhoods that have, been, that have needed investment for years um, which is what um, Invest Southwest is all about, particularly in those communities. What's that, what's that balance to be struck? Well, let me take a cut at it and then Samir can follow up. First of all, we're committed to all of Chicago. 
Uh, there's no one area that can get more intention than the other. Resources are limited. Uh, we're spreading them as best we can. I want to take another crack at a question I thought will probably be coming up, and that's the issue of safety and, and the violence that's occurred. I want you to know that the mayor addresses it as her number one issue right now to make sure that she's doing everything she can. The Chicago Police Department, federal agencies, local law enforcement throughout the community, throughout the region are all working together. We've got reaction plans as well as dealing with the issues of the people that were involved. I think it's fair to say, if you look at the data, some of this was very organized. It was very organized criminal activity that took advantage of honest de demonstrations and demonstrators, and uh, they're going to be dealt with. So it is a top priority of the mayor right now. She's on top of it. She's bringing in the very best people she can, getting all the help she can from other places that have been through this. And uh, we recognize that that's an issue that's on everybody's mind. So uh, we get that, and it's very important. Number two, there aren't going to be enough resources. That's why we hope that the federal government will help out in this stimulus program. When you're spending the kind of money that the federal government is spending for stimulus, it would make sense that one of the great cities of Chicago, along with the other cities, should get a part of that to rebuild it. Because the best thing we can do is get these people back to work and get them working and get them back to school and make up for the lost time in the schoolroom. And that's going to take resources. But right now, the mayor is basically addressing the problems, recognizing that there are fiscal issues that go with it. But we can't sit still and wait for Washington. But we hope that Washington will help out so we can do more. But there's no one place. Uh, it's a kind of a no-win situation. Uh, everybody wants more. And uh, there's no area that's more important uh, than the south and the southwest side of Chicago. But also, if we don't have a vibrant business and, and retail business in Chicago, they're going to be hurt the most because the job loss that we've seen has been in those spaces where these individuals have been per performing and have been working for a number of years. So it, uh, it's a balancing. Uh, there's not enough to go around, but what resources plus some are being put addressing all of them. And I think you can see that in the report. This report was drafted before basically some of these issues came up, but nothing is suffering. It's just that we're putting additional resources into the safety issues and finding primarily making sure that uh, the people, the, the criminals that are uh, d taking advantage of the people, the situation and making it harder for people are uh, going to be brought to justice, both in the state and the federal system. Samir, do you have any, any thoughts to add to that? Well, what I'd say is Mayor Lightfoot's completely focused on downtown and the neighborhoods. You know, this is not a trade-off. We are absolutely in this together. And the strength and vibrancy of downtown is also dependent on the strength and vibrancy of our neighborhoods and vice versa. And so that's one of the reasons why, as you heard what Sam mentioned, we've been tremendously focused on making sure that we keep downtown safe, that our commercial corridors are vibrant, but we've been just as focused on making sure that our neighborhood commercial corridors are safe that they're vibrant, that we're promoting equity and how we distribute city resources. So we fundamentally reject that there's a trade-off between downtown and the neighborhoods because we are absolutely in this together. And the resource allocation and the focus of this administration, which is based on equity, uh, recognizes that Invest Southwest can be successful, as can a plan to really ensure that downtown comes back from COVID even stronger. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Holly Agra, who, as you know, runs uh, uh, Chicago's First Lady Cruises. Is the city currently lobbying Congress to help local businesses with additional PPP loans and to provide help for Chicagoans who are still unemployed? The answer is yes, but Samir can amplify that. It's, it's, it's crucial that we get support from Washington. And I'm optimistic we're going to get support from Washington. It's a matter of when and what form. But we're going to, the city of Chicago, with the support of the, our members in Congress, especially the Senators Durbin and Duckworth, are at the table every day arguing for city and Illinois to get those additional funding. And I'm cautiously optimistic that we will be there. It's just a matter of when. So we, everybody recognizes we need help. And uh, we think they're, they're, we will be getting help in the uh, not, not too distant future. Yeah, we have a we have a, actually an office. A lot of you might not know this. We have an office in Washington D.C. 
that is solely focused on making sure that they are advocating for the needs of Chicago and Washington. So between the U.S. Conference of Mayors, of which the mayor, uh, Mayor Lightfoot's really taken a leadership role in, and our federal delegation, uh, the mayor is very focused, as is our team in D.C., of really pressing Washington to help step up and support municipalities. Yeah, I would add to that, that also that uh, this is a regional issue. The municipalities are working together, both uh, in the suburbs as well as the city, and the governor, I'm giving a shout to the governor, they're all, we're all in lockstep on this, getting more money for the state of Illinois and Chicago. Okay, um, question from Jennifer Clark from Loyola University. What role do you see for Chicago's colleges and universities in rebuilding the economy and reinventing the city's brand? Well, I'd start out, keep doing what you're doing, making the, uh, we've got a great system here in, in Illinois and in Chicago. Uh, the schools are very, have very difficult challenges to manage when the people come back to school and how they come back to school and how they're tested and how it's safe. I think the universities in Chicago have done a really great job of staying on top of this with the support of the mayor, who obviously has got this as his number one concern as well, along with another, a number of number one concerns. And uh, I think just keep what you're doing. Uh, also, you should be looking for opportunities in Washington for additional funding for the universities uh, to deal with some of the issues they have. And if they get that money, they will be able to support us. But they do a phenomenal job. And that's not just Lyle and Illinois and Chicago and Northwestern, but it's all of the community colleges and all of them uh, that are uh, really, I think, doing a phenomenal job. I've watched what's going on in the rest of the country and uh, they're struggling uh, because they're not as well thought out as the, the schools, the uh, the higher education schools in the state of Illinois. And I'm very proud of them, frankly, very proud of the students, very proud of the administrators. Okay, um, Steve Schlickman from Schlickman and Associates. Uh, maybe you're out in Colorado right now. Um, the dramatic increase in telecommuting during the pandemic seems to be having a positive cost saving effect for many businesses. Will this, however, have a long-term negative effect on the central business district economic activity? Yeah, so this is yeah, so this is something we have been very focused on, right? What what is the future, uh, especially of offices? And uh, you know, this our team has been engaged with a number of the uh, property owners, landlords, commercial real estate brokers to really hear what they're hearing. Uh, and you know, right now there's been a lot of kind of what I'll say is uh, indecision, right? A lot of corporate leaders and companies, obviously in this time of crisis, they don't want to cancel a lease. They might not want to extend the lease and they're basically in monitoring mode. What we've heard is many companies are looking to expand space. There was this trend to kind of cramming more people into an office, open office concept. Um, and, and you might see some trends away from that, obviously given the, the challenges of the pandemic. Um, but then also there's kind of this acceptance of remote work and telework, um, which could lead to slightly more uh, percentages of, of workers working remotely. Um, but what we've heard is that people do want to get back to the office. There's an intangible benefit of being in person. Uh, and so what we could see is some more hoteling, uh, some more shared space being used, but larger space per employees. And this is something that we are monitoring with. Uh, we have a group of developers and real estate brokers and others, you know, getting together almost on a weekly basis, having this conversation. And we're paying close attention to the statistics. But, you know, the, the, the doom story of, of cities has been told many times over over the course of the past few centuries. And cities have always been resilient. So we are optimistic on the future of Chicago. We know we will get through this. And we know that those intangibles of being together and that importance of social interaction will be back one day. I would just add to that, that we know that the environment of the future it will be changed as a result of what's happened the last six months. And the city and the, the staff and others are on top of that. So what we can plan for is the, the, that the environment of the future, which will include a lot of what we have, will deliver in a little different ways, but we're not gonna be Stick, stuck in the mud, so to speak, if the environment changes, the city of Chicago and the mayor and the leadership of the city council and the business community, we're going to be there with the right model for the right future 
that uh, is predicted. All right. This comes from one of our sponsors today, John Welber. How do you see Chicago's airports, particularly O'Hare, leading the charge in the city's recovery from COVID? Well, well transportation is a major asset. Uh, it's uh, obviously what we have now is the airlines have faced the biggest challenge in their in their history, really. Uh, it's much bigger challenge than they faced in 9-11, as big as that was. Uh, right now, for a variety of reasons, people aren't traveling. They're reluctant to travel. Uh, and uh, capacity is at uh, 10 to 15, 20% of what it was. The airlines are getting ready for the, when they come. But uh, until we get through this difficult time, they're going to be challenged. And we're not going to make people fly if they don't want to fly. What we got to do is make sure that all the things surrounding it, the flying on the airplane is safe. With masks and everything else, it's safe. And people understand that. Uh, if it's safe to get there because mass transit has done unbelievable things in keeping the rails uh, and buses clean and distance. So we've got to just, over time, I think people will get more comfortable doing that. But it's going to be a while because other parts of the, the country are not where we are. Uh, and people aren't going to travel to places where they're going to be quarantined for 14 days as soon as they get there. Uh, so I think it's a matter of time. Uh, I think the airports are really doing a good job, but we can't make people travel. We've got to create environments where they feel it's comfortable to travel and there's business activity to generate their travel. Yeah, and Mayor Lightfoot's been in touch personally with the CEOs of the large carriers. This is a difficult time for them, uh, but there are glimmers of hope. You know, I was just at O'Hare on Thursday last week where we inaugurated the first flight from Chicago to Tel Aviv. Uh, so there are some areas of growth that we are seeing, uh, and certainly the mayor and the airlines are deeply committed to the $8.5 billion modernization of O'Hare. O'Hare is such a tremendous asset of the city. It's one of the reasons why we've had such a tremendous growth in corporate headquarters here, and we're going to keep investing in our, uh, in our asset. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why last year O'Hare uh, saw the busiest passenger traffic. So we're, we're not going to stop investing in the airport. And we know that the industry will get through this. And I'm going to second what Sam said. When you look at the studies about air circulation and purification in airplanes, um, they are safe. Uh, and and we, we do expect, and you'll see, um, the airlines do expect recovery once there is a, a vaccine and wider adoption of it. All right, we've got time for just a couple more questions. This one comes from Adam Scheffler. Expanding mental health and addiction services is often recommended, but hardly ever sufficiently realized. What will be different this time? Well, that's the mayor. The mayor is very concerned about it. So you can go into the details. But uh, the, the real key here is be able to deliver it in the communities that don't have access to it. And using the internet, using telehealth, finding safe places for them to get it within their community are all things that the task force is looking at. Uh, and the demand is going to be greater. But I would argue that as a result of the telehealth and the result of, of everybody understanding we can deliver easier than we make it easier for people who don't have transportation or have issues, make it easier for them to get that. This has created new opportunities and the city is going to make sure there's facilities available as well as telehealth available. And I know the health systems in this country, I mean, in the city are committed. And I just want to give a shout out to all of those essential workers during this difficult time in the health industry, those that are providing mental health, those that are providing protection, uh, the police officers, the firemen, the state Illinois State Police, and every and the regional people in the healthcare space, all those essential workers that are putting themselves somewhat at risk, which we're trying to mitigate to make the city go and position us for the future. Those are the real heroes of this, and we owe them a great thanks every day. And we're going to, you know, we firmly recognize that marketing is an important component of this. We have to build awareness of the platforms that we're making investments in. So thanks to some of the federal investment from CARES money, we do have a significant portion of money allocated to supporting more mental health services, as Sam mentioned. But it's not just about implementing those services. It's about building awareness on, on them and destigmatizing the need for mental health services. And that's why in our recovery task force report, we talked about the need to build a healing centered region. Part of this is absolutely a marketing effort to building awareness on that. And that's something that you're going to be seeing coming next year. 
I know there'll be one more oh, question yeah. in case we get cut off. I just, I just want to say that uh, these are challenging times that we're taking advantage of this uh, to really position ourselves for the future. And uh, what can you do? Uh, I think we can make sure every company and every individual, every business on this call makes the diversity uh, and equality on their agenda. And whether it be at board meetings or meetings, it's not just something you can do now. It's going to be constant. It ought to be a priority. What we've learned over the last 40 years that investment uh, is required and attention to this issue and these issues that we face have to be constantly in the boardroom, in the business offices, because uh, that's what's going to make this city uh, even better than it is. Thank you both. Uh, well said. Thank you both for joining us today. Again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, 8 Hospitality, AECOM, CRRC, John Wober Concessions, Kivit, and Stiefel. I would also like to remind everyone um, who's participating today that City Club of Chicago is a 501c3 nonprofit. We welcome contributions, any and all. Thank you very much. And before we go, I have a couple of things that you'll be getting um, not in person today, but we'll be sending them to you. Uh, a complimentary one-year membership to the City Club of Chicago and the hot commodity of the official mug. Um, so thank you both again. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day. We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.